Can I welcome everyone to the third meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? We have received apologies from Mary Fee. She's attending another committee meeting this morning. The first item of business is a decision on whether to take item eight of this meeting in private and are members content to take the work programme discussion in private? Thank you. The committee, the next item of business, the committee has three pieces of subordinate legislation to consider today. Two are instruments subject to the affirmative procedure and one is subject to the negative procedure. I should explain that each affirmative instrument has two agenda items. Firstly, the committee will have the opportunity to ask questions of the minister and to officials, and after that there will be a debate on the motions on the published agenda. Details of the instrument subject to the affirmative procedure are included in paper one. We start with consideration of the Police Act 1997 and the Protection of Vulnerable Groups, Scotland Act 2007, Remedial Order 2018. And I welcome to the meeting for her first appearance before the committee. Marie Todd, MSP, Minister for Childcare and Early Years, Lynn McMinn, Policy Manager, Disclosure Scotland, and Ailsa Hine, Senior Principal Legal Officer, Scottish Government. And I invite the Minister to make an opening statement to explain the order. Welcome, Minister. Good morning, Convener and Committee Members, and thank you for that kind welcome. I look forward to working with you all for many years to come. Um, thank you for inviting me to this meeting and for the opportunity to contribute to the committee's discussion about the Draft Police Act 1997 and the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 2007 Remedial Order 2018. I'd like to thank the Parliament, this committee, officials and business managers for their support in timetabling Parliament's consideration of this remedial order and later the amendment order. The remedial order further refines higher level disclosure system in Scotland that applies when someone wants to work or volunteer with children, vulnerable adults or in certain professions, for example, financial services. It deals with what the state, that is Disclosure Scotland, will disclose in response to higher level disclosure requests. In other words, an application for a standard or an enhanced disclosure or a PVG record scheme. The order builds on the reforms we made in September 2015 following a United Kingdom Supreme Court ruling in June 2014 that disclosures issued under the Police Act in England and Wales were incompatible with Article 8, the right to respect for private and family life of the European Convention on Human Rights. Subsequently, a judicial review in the Court of Session challenged the operation of the PVG scheme. In the case P versus Scottish Ministers, Lord Pentland declared that insofar as they required automatic disclosure of the petitions, petitioner's conviction before the children's hearing, the provisions of the PVG Act, as amended in 2015, unlawfully and unjustifiably interfered with the petitioner's right under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. The effect of the court order, except in relation to the petitioner, was suspended until 17th of February this year, 2018, to allow ministers to remedy the legislation. A 60-day consultation period on the proposed draft remedial order finished on 26 November. Ministers have taken account of observations received and published a statement responding to them. The statement was laid in Parliament on the 15th of December 2017 and advised only minor changes are being made to the proposed draft remedial order. In proposing this order, we recognise that safeguarding must be balanced with the appropriate protection of rights of an individual to private life and allowing those with past criminal background to move on. We believe that the proposed amendments to the system of higher level disclosure strikes an appropriate balance. And I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, before I ask if any of our members have got a question, just, just one, this is a second remedial order on the same matter. How certain are the government that the changes will satisfy the court and at the same time provide the necessary protection for vulnerable groups? So we're very comfortable that this will satisfy um, the court. And uh, yes, we are also um, believe that um, it will strike the correct balance between protection of vulnerable people and the human rights of offenders. Protection of vulnerable people is absolutely at the heart of um, the um, entire system of um, PVG checking, and um, we believe this will make the, the right balance. 
Um, as your question implies, we've had to remedy this legislation once before. And of course, any parliament wants to um, anticipate every possible situation when developing um, law. But this particular situation arose from a combination of very individual circumstances which are extremely unusual. Um, and I think we'll all agree um, that it's almost impossible to anticipate every circumstance and that to use case law to refine primary legislation is um, an important part of the system. OK, thank you very much. Liz? Uh, just one uh, question, Minister. Just on the technical point uh, that you mentioned about the 2018 proposed draft order, there seems to be a slight difference of opinion um, between the Law Society and the Children's Reporter uh, about the um, proposed amendments. Has that been addressed, that difference of opinion? Um, um, I'm not quite sure what difference of opinion you're referring uh, to. It's, uh, here, the, the quote from the Law Society says that it very much agrees and would support the amendments put forward by the proposed draft order. Um, the Scottish Children's Reporter is saying that the proposed remedy may make the situation more complex. Has that been addressed? I think we've taken as the basis of the re proposed remedy the, the um, judgment that was given in the, in the court, and we followed the judges, um, some of the judges, the judge proposed certain remedies himself, and we have taken on board those proposals when developing the remedy. So we've been guided very much by the judge in the case which was under review. Uh, Joanne, then Ross, then Tom. Yeah, um, I dealt with specific case this. I want to um, ask and general terms about something that's drawn from direct experience and it is of a young person who's been through a tough time in their lives ends up um, in a situation which you could imagine say in a public place or a bit of a scrap with somebody else not physical violence or anything takes the jacket throws it down um, there's a referral to the children's hearing which the family welcomes because they're concerned that the, the young person is distressed there's things going on in their lives so they accept and I've dealt with a lot of young people <clears throat> who go into the hearing system for that very reason, and we support this hearing system because it's focused on the needs of the child. There is no um, proof at court on these issues. However, six, seven, eight years later, a young person applies to work in a hospital, and what comes up on disclosure is assault and robbery. Now, that can't be right, and that must be against the 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 view of what the purpose of the hearing system is. And I do note that the children's reporter and the children's commissioner are expressing concern about this question. You have not um, enacted provisions in the 2011 legislation which would have addressed this problem. And I wonder what reassurance you can give me that in terms of <clears throat> what, it's not even a spent conviction, it is as a consequence of a young person's challenging experience at that time is then coming up in disclosure and that must be something it's the antithesis of the hearing system and I wonder if you have a view on that because I think Liz Smith is right to highlight that both the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration and the Children's Commission are expressing concerns if not about this order about the policy um, that's round about it. So the proposed changes we seek um, seek to strike a balance between the proportionality, fairness and public protection issues. At the heart of it, as I stated, is the safety um, of vulnerable groups. And um, we think it's important that relevant um, conviction information is still available for employers in order to make their decision in some cases. So this provides a right to appeal to a sheriff and the sheriff will take into account the circumstances around the offence when making a decision as to whether it can be removed from, from the disclosure or not. Um, the sheriff will also take into account the type of work or the reason for the application for disclosure when making that decision. So we think this puts in place a really robust system which strikes the correct balance between protection of vulnerable groups and the right of individuals, and particularly young individuals, to move past um, offending behaviour. So you think that a young troubled person who goes into the hearing system to get help can have something that's never been challenged? I mean, I think if it's been challenged in court, they would have challenged that description of it being assault and robbery or whatever it might be. 
that a young person who goes into the hearing system ends up, six, seven, eight years later, being defined in disclosure as somebody who is not able to, to that, do that particular job. And I hear what you say about um, appealing to a sheriff. How realistic is that for most people as a, as a redress? Now, you may not be able to deal with it in this order. What I would look for a reassurance is that you will look at this question, because I am very troubled that young people who I encourage people to go into the hearing system. When I, was, I encourage them in the basis that they would get help and get support. They would, because of um, the authority of the panel, they could draw resources to that young person. They don't ever get the opportunity to test in court the description of what the offence is. And later on, they end up in a position where um, it, uh, it creates the impression of something quite different from what happened. And also, I would say that even if, theoretically, you could appeal to the court, the damage is already done because somebody has looked at your application. They're not necessarily going to tell you that's the reason why they're not employing you. Can I just clarify yeah, that the, the disclosure won't have been seen by an employer if someone chooses to appeal, to, to make an application to the sheriff to have a conviction removed. This young but person only knew about it when they, when they went for the job and then were told why they didn't get it. Right, OK, OK. Let's, well, that may have been but, under well, uh, Excuse me, previous. let's speak through the chair. The, Minister, you've been asked a question about will you take that away, will you have a look at, uh, and see about how that can, we can deal with that in the general. It's not about a specific order. No, and I would absolutely take it away and I would, um, we'll look again at the, um, I mean, my understanding is that what's disclosed on, on, on the disclosure should not necessarily prevent you from getting a job. What it does is give the employer information in which to risk assess the situation um, and there are protections in place for people. However, um, there's, a, there's a genuine point there that absolutely. what's on the disclosure will, will impact on, on decisions. Absolutely, and I will take that there forward. There's a second related issue to this, that, well, we that, which is, I mean, the, 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 I, I hear what you say, but I think that the reality is that people are choosing amongst a whole range of people. They're making a judgment on somebody without having the full information. Can you give us reassurances around spent convictions and disclosures that, um, the, that we have the same level playing field as in the rest of the United Kingdom? And as somebody has raised with me the issue around spent convictions, that if they were elsewhere in the United Kingdom, the, their offence would have been deemed by now to be a spent conviction, but the Scottish Government has not yet caught up with that. And despite correspondence with the Cabinet Secretary, it's not been resolved. I think I'm, I'm going to ask my officials to answer that te particular technical aspect for you. Um, the legislation is very different in the four nations in the United Kingdom. It's, so um, the rehabilitation of offenders legislation is within devolved competence. So then there's quite likely to be some divergence between England and Scotland. And the, uh, the English rules on when uh, convictions became spent were changed, uh, I think, in 2013. And the Scottish Government is currently looking, as far as I understand, at a, the a Rehabilitation of Offenders Act. There is um, there was a consultation on it, and uh, there's also to be a management uh, of offenders bill at some point in this session. I think it would be a matter of some uh, benefit to us if we knew what the planned timetable for that was. My understanding is that while it's been resolved um, elsewhere in the United Kingdom, we're getting reassurances that it'll be resolved in Scotland, but hasn't yet been done so. So if I could get a timetable for that, that would be extremely helpful. OK, thank you. Um... Very briefly, uh, convener, just to pick up on uh, the issue that you raised yourself, the Minister's uh, kindly agreed to give some clarification on that. I think uh, to pick up from what Joanne Lambert was saying in her first issue, the problem we have is obviously uh, uh, there's, there's one group, the Law Society, is giving a very distinct uh, legal ruling on this, whereas uh, the other two who've given uh, us um, some comment that's of slightly more concern um, are those that are working with the children's hearing system. And I think um, we want to be absolutely clear in our own mind as a committee uh, that, that there is no uh, serious problem there, that legal experts have taken a very different view from those who are dealing uh, with children. As Jan uh, Lamont has said, that you know, have asked to be in the hearing system or recommended to be in the hearing system because they want help. Um, we would not like to sign up to something that was preventing that. Sorry, Ross. Yeah, thanks, Convener. It's, uh, not a question, just a feel before we proceed, I should refer members to the fact that I'm a member of the PVG scheme, Clear to Work with Vulnerable Groups on behalf of the Church of Scotland. Thank you very much, Tavish. 
Thank you. I just wanted to ask a question uh, related to Liz Smith's question about the Children's Report Administration, because in the evidence to this committee, they have said that this proposed remedy does make the situation more complex and confusing, and, they say, and therefore less fair as a result, by creating two separate lists of offences with a right to have a sheriff review offences from either list. I just want to understand why two separate lists are being created. So the two separate lists of offences were created with an earlier remedy back in 2015, um, and um, that's that the, 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 they're already in in exis existence. That's not we're not creating two new lists in the in this piece of. What we're doing is providing a right to appeal for the eight schedule. No, no, but I'm sorry. The, the reports administration is telling us that um, the the, rep, the proposed remedy creates two separate lists of offences. I'm quite taking point. If that's not true, I'm uh -huh. perfectly happy to be corrected. Two separate lists of offences with a right to have a sheriff review offences from either list instead of two lists where offences on one would remain. Okay. So that's, I suppose, the point, isn't it? Yes. So the right to appeal to a sheriff exists for both lists now. Yes. Why, why, why the change then? What, what's the advantage of the change the government are proposing? So the advantage of the change is that it um, makes the legislation compliant with ECHR as directed by the judge in the case um, of P um, versus the Scottish ministers. So the judge has ordered us, um, or has has um, looked at the legislation, decided that it wasn't the fix that was the remedy that was put in place in 2015 was not compliant with ECHR and has asked us to repair that. The government accept that we've now got a situation, as Liz and Joanne have just illustrated, where some people who work with children in children's panels consider this to be less fair. So judges get this wrong now and again, as to be said. Okay. So, but it, so what, does the government have a reflection on the fact that people giving evidence to this committee are saying they're concerned this, this remedy is less fair on the children that we're all trying to help? I think that this... I mean, I'll reiterate again, I think that this piece of legislation um, strikes the appropriate balance between the um, offenders who wish to move beyond um, situations which have happened in childhood or um, not necessarily in childhood, in adulthood as well, this legislation covers, but also strikes the appropriate balance for those who wish to work with an, um, vulnerable people and the protection of vulnerable people. It, it is always tricky to navigate that, and I think this piece of legislation does stri strike the appropriate balance between those two needs. Yeah, the said in some circumstances there was a need for flexibility. Could you outline, give me some examples of what you've decided on has actually given flexibility around the um, disclosure scheme? For, for, for people that have been in the, the hearing system. What, what's meant by flexibility and how has that been enacted and what you're putting forward to us today? So the, the sheriff will take into account the circumstances of the original offence uh, when making his decision on whether um, information goes on to the disclosure and will also take into account the type of uh, the reason for the disclosure being applied mm -hmm. for. So, so does like that mean then a situation, maybe something like Joanne Lamont's maybe de described, where the offence has, has been fairly minor, but has been enough for somebody to be put in, into the, the hearing system in order to help them, that they make a judgment that they would never actually go in the disclosure in the first place? Or, or is it a case of it, there has to be an appeal to make sure that it comes off disclosure? Um, mm -hmm. <coughs> As the system stands, we have basically three offence lists. We have offence lists that are deemed so serious, which is what we've, we're have we here today to look at, which we've included a new appeal mechanism for those. We've got offences that um, are on Schedule 8B, which are offences that are deemed to be serious, but not as serious as those in 8A. Those offences can be appealable to a sheriff as soon as they're spent. Um, and will automatically come off a certificate after seven and a half years if the individual was under 18 at the time of conviction or 15 years if the individual was an adult at the time of conviction. There's also a number of very minor offences that will never appear on a certificate as soon as they're spent. Um, so so that so that's seven and a half years, they would, minor offences would be on but, and then they would automatically be taken off, yeah. but there's, not a, there's nothing that can... But they can appeal it as soon as it becomes spent. Yeah. Okay, so that may be 
five years or however long the rehabilitation period is for the disposal that they've received. So it wouldn't have to be at the seven and a no. half years, it could be well before Only that if point? Only if it's an 8B offence, any, any offence not on a Schedule A or 8B will just come off as soon as they're spent and will not be disclosed right. if they're spent. Right, thank um, you for clarifying that. Thank you. Okay, I'll over very briefly then, Joanne and then George. Uh, thank you, convener. I mm -hmm. wondered if I could ask the Minister what consideration was given to the alternative approach set out by the Children's Commissioner that would have moved the onus on to authorities to argue against a presumption uh, that information should automatically be removed after a set period of time. I think at, at the moment uh, um, we have a number of pieces of legislation and reviews going on which all fit together with this uh, to make a bigger picture. And one of them is the minimum age of criminal responsibility review, and I think that's where um, it, it, that you know that will be considered if, if successful. That piece of legislation will list will lift a number of people, um, young children, out of the situation where this will ever, ever apply to them. A very specific question. The Children's Aid in Scotland Act 2011 includes at sections 108 to 78 provision that would allow some offences at hearing to be recorded as, quote, alternatives to prosecution rather than as a conviction, which I think would address the concerns I've raised. These provisions have not been commenced. Can you explain why? I'll ask. Um, the, for, the provisions in the 2011 Act couldn't be commenced at first because um, we needed to get a Section 104 order under the Scotland Act to, to, so that the Scottish Government had sufficient powers um, to uh, implement properly Sections 187 and 188. The Section 104 order um, was only obtained um, very shortly before we did the remedial order in 2015. So there wasn't ever a chance to commence those sections. When we did the remedial order in, uh, in, in 2015, we, we felt that the situation was made a, a more uh, preferable for children who had a, a hearings conviction. In terms of the powers that are in sections 187 and 188, they are relatively limited, and they, they would allow us to make the children's hearings um, convictions alternatives to prosecution, but they were also providing for a list of offences that were always to be disclosed. And there wasn't any other provision, there wasn't, the, the power was limited to making a list of offences that would always to be disclosed, didn't give us any powers to make any provision uh, for for some offences uh, to be disclosed or, uh, or for a lesser period of time. So that is the main reason that those provisions have not been commenced. They, they won't work very well with the provisions of the remedial order. And uh, the, the government is doing further work on looking at those provisions and, and the, the uh, convictions that are obtained through a children's hearing system. and. Uh, there is the uh, minimum age of criminal responsibility bill that is proposed also in this session, which we'll consider that, further. But with the respect that the criminal age of responsibility has got nothing to do with this, this is about young people in the hearing system. And this is seven years since clearly the Parliament thought they had a remedy to a problem. You're saying it wasn't the right remedy. Seven years later, we don't have a remedy to that problem. And I think that's fundamental. Okay. And I do, I this would look, I, well, well it, it does call into question the effect of this, this subordinate <clears throat> legislation. I do think we need to test it. And I, and I am concerned that we're in a position where the core problem was trying to be addressed in 2011 is still not being addressed. Can I come in at this point? I mean, can I just clarify what, what you said? Uh, in relation to what you said, Ms McMahon, earlier on. Uh, are, are, you, are you suggesting that the flexibility that you were talking about, about a spent conviction, after a spent conviction you could have it uh, uh, written out, wouldn't be available if we put the 187, 188? Is that what you were saying? There, there was a power to um, set up a list of offences that would always be disclosed. And the um, it would be it would be more difficult then to have the the um, offences that are only disclosed for certain periods of time 
I think there would have been uh, um, offences. You could have left. Obviously, there would have been some offences that were not on the list of those that were always to be disclosed. Mm. But there was less flexibility around the power. And I mean, when the power was devised, the case law in relation to disclosures was much less developed. And it was devised at a time when all convictions were disclosed. And the case law has moved on since that point. The power is no longer really uh, sufficient to, 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 to provide the kind of system that the courts are now looking for in relation to disclosures. OK, thank you. George and then Richard. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Uh, I'd like to ask the question, that, well, two questions, actually, but the first one would be, is it not the case that this has been a challenging policy and has changed regardless of party colour? It's, uh, it's been something that's been adapted and changed over the period. And uh, is it not a case that the fact that you're responding to what's been through the courts is a positive thing in itself? Because I know of many solicitors that don't believe that any legislation from this place is actually of any value until they have tested it through the courts. So really, is it not the case that uh, this is the right way to go forward and that the really uh, we need to, it will constantly be tinkered with this scheme as we move forward because things will change? You're absolutely correct. Yeah. As I said already, as a parliament, we want to, our legislation to anticipate every possible circumstance, but, but that's just not um, possible in reality. The original legislation, which was brought forward by the Labour Lib Dem administration, um, including, I think, some people who are on this committee, um, had full parliamentary support. Um, it's not unheard of for case law to refine um, primary legislation, particularly when, if you think of the intervening period, the changes which have occurred in terms of our understanding of sexual offending, our um, understanding of human rights. So it is perfectly understandable, I would say, that there has been a reflection and a requirement to refine the original primary legislation. And I think it does strengthen the legislation, I would agree. Uh, my, my second question would be, it's just, just uh, it's more a technical, functional question. If we didn't pass this SSI today, what would happen and what would be the potential fallout? So I'm sure everyone in this room is absolutely aware that the Scottish ministers, because of the Scotland Act, cannot act in a way that is incompatible with ECHR. So if the orders aren't approved, then we have to go back to the Court of Session and ask the Court for a continuation of the suspension um, of the effect of the judgment for a longer period <coughs> to allow time to try to pass amending legislation. Now, if the Court, if that suspension um, to, is, is um, not continued, then our executive agency, Disclosure Scotland, um, would have to stop completely issuing higher level um, disclosures because ministers cannot act in contravention of ECHR. Um, we would need to put forward fresh proposals to uh, remedy this legislation and uh, consult on those again and bring them forward to Parliament again. Um, the higher level disclosure system could not operate during that time. And to give you an indication, so stakeholders are broadly very supportive of the disclosure system. Everybody understands that there um, may be situations where um, people fall on the wrong side of, the, of, of certain lines, but, but um, generally people are very supportive of this legislation and about a thousand cases a day go through the disclosure system, so about a they issue around a thousand higher level disclosures every day. Thank you. I wanted to come in briefly and then I want to move on. Yes, uh, convener, can you just clarify, I mean, there is a, a fundamental difference between a committee uh, voting on this and deciding it's not the right legislation than asking for further clarification on the points that have been raised. Um, would it be possible to get that further clarification? Before we move this, before we vote on this. Yeah. If, if that was the, the view of the committee, then we'd, we'd have to come back again next Wednesday and do it. Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm, can I speak personally, obviously, on this? I, I mean, minded generally to uh, accept the general principles um, but I'm slightly uncomfortable that we've not had the clarification that perhaps we would need just to ensure that that happens. If, if we're going to be voting on it, we can get the clarification, 
surely we could get clarification from the, the Minister to the committee. I mean, if you're talking about your vote on, on, on it and in favour of it, then surely any clarification <coughs> we, want, we can get from the Minister after. Can I, in order to be, to be helpful, can I just say this has nothing to do with party politics and it's absolutely all to do with getting the right um, legislation and it is, in my case, driven by a, a specific case. I would like... I mean, I, I understand the force of what the consequence of this not going through, and I accept that. But I would want an absolute commitment to look at the question, the policy question that drove the legislation in 2011, and would look at the consequences for young people of having been described as having a conviction, when we all know that they were troubled and there was difficulty, and that's the very purpose of the hearing system. So the reassurance I'd be looking for is that there would... I mean, I'm quite happy to write to the Minister separately on a specific case. We've had correspondence with the Scottish Government before on this, um, but I would be looking for an absolute a commitment that you would look at the policy area and a timetable to address this, because I think that's what the children's um, recorder, the reporter and the children's commissioner are wanting. And the, fundamentally, the idea that an appeal to the sheriff is a redress for some of these young people, it's just... It's just, it's not appropriate. Um, and so it's, it's connected to the policy that drove the act in 2011 and what actually is now getting taken to address that, that concern. There's a, there's a separate issue, which I can again write to the Minister about, around spent convictions, what's happened elsewhere. But I wouldn't want to be seen to be trying to obstruct legislation that's going to protect people, far from it. But I, I would be looking for very strong reassurances around these so, issues. Right, thank you. Thank you for that, John. So, would that satisfy you as well? Y it? Yes, it would, Convener. I, I feel very much the same. They don't want to be obstructive about it. Um, but I do think there are some fundamental concerns that we would like an undertaking from the Minister that she would come back and uh, clarify and uh, provide us with that um, secure knowledge. OK. No other comments? Thank you. Uh, in that case, we will then move on to item three, which is the formal debate on motion S5M 9985 in the name of the Minister. I will remind everyone that officials are not permitted to contribute to the formal debates, and I ask the Minister to move the motion. I move that the Education and Skills Committee recommend that the Police Act 1997 and the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 2007 Remedial Order 2018 be approved. Uh, any other contributions from the panel? Okay. In that case, the question is that motion S5M 9985 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The committee must report to Parliament on this instrument. Are members content for me as convener to sign off the report? Thank you. In that case, we now move on to consideration of the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974, Exclusions and Exemptions, Exceptions, Scotland Amendment Order. Again, I invite the Minister to make an opening statement explaining the order. Minister. Thank you. The second order you're considering today is the Draft Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974, Exclusions and Exceptions, Scotland Amendment Order 2018. The amendment order is needed so that the self-disclosure requirements placed on an individual are aligned with the reforms in the state disclosure that we've discussed already. The amendment order makes changes to the Rehabilitation of Offenders legislation to achieve that. The reforms in the amendment order mean that an individual will be protected from having to self-disclose a spent conviction that has met certain criteria for an offence that is included in Schedule A1 of the 2013 Exclusions and Exceptions Order during the period of an appeal to a sheriff for removal of the conviction from a higher level disclosure. Those criteria that the individual's conviction is spent and either seven years and six months must have passed from the date of conviction if the individual was under 18 years of age at the date of conviction or 15 years must have passed from the date of conviction if the individual was aged 18 years or over at the date of conviction. The reforms also mean that the individual cannot be prejudiced by failure to disclose a spent conviction for Schedule A1 offence during that appeal process if a prospective employer learns about the offence by another means. Lastly, the amendment order provides that once the appeal process to the sheriff is concluded and the sheriff finds that the state should disclose the spent conviction appealed, then a prospective employer will be able to take account of the conviction and the person will have to self-disclose the conviction of asked. I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions on this? 
Okay, in that case, we now move on to item five, which is the formal debate on motion S5M9984 in the name of the Minister. Again, I will remind everyone that officials are not permitted to contribute to formal debates, and I ask the Minister to move the motion. I move that the Education and Skills Committee recommends that the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974, Exclusions and Exceptions, Scotland, Amendment Order 2018, be approved. Thank you. Any contributions from members? Okay. In that case, I put the question. The question is that motion S5M9984 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. As with the previous instrument, are members content for me as convener to sign off a report? Thank you. And at this point, I thank the Minister and her officials for their attendance, and I will now suspend for a moment to allow the witnesses to leave. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, the final piece of subordinate legislation the committee has to consider today is the Teachers' Pension Scheme Scotland No. 2, Amendment Regulations 2017. SSI 2017-454, which is a negative instrument. Details of this instrument are provided in Paper 2. Do members have any comments on this instrument? I'm taking your silences. No? Uh, in that case, thank you very much. We'll move on to the next item of business, is uh, consideration of responses to the committee's report on school infrastructure published in October 2017. The responses to a report are included in paper three. And before I ask for any comments from colleagues, I would like to say that this inquiry, built on the work of Professor Cole and his inquiry into school closures in Edinburgh, I believe our work added value, included, uh, including by raising the profile of Professor Cole's important findings. It is, of course, vital that education authorities undertook work to reassure us that the school estate is safe and ensure that new schools are built to an appropriate standard. We have received responses from a number of organisations, including the Scottish Government. I have one suggested follow-up action, and I am not sure if members saw in the press cuttings over the weekend that a number of schools in Fife lacked adequate sprinkler systems. 
One of the themes in the Cole report was about adequate, inadequate fire stopping. I think it might be worthwhile writing to the Scottish Government and asking about its response to those reports in the media. In addition to this action, members will be aware that the committee agreed to revisit all of its report recommendations annually, so work in this area will be monitored on an ongoing basis. Apart from keeping a watch and briefing this way, do members have any specific comments or suggestions for further action? To say that we should copy that letter that you sent to the Scottish Government to uh, David, who, David Stewart, who's got the private members bill on, sorry, private bill on um, the question of sprinklers. I think is he not? Yep. Okay. That, that, that's a sensible suggestion. Nothing else. Okay. In that case, that brings us to the end of the. Sorry, oh, sorry, Joanne. I wonder whether I can um, just attach it to this because I'm not quite sure where else to attach it to mm -hmm. and it's the question of process around dealing with, with witnesses and I think we had very good witnesses in this regard. Um, I'm sure people shared my concern about the Freedom of Information um, request that was published on the 10th of January which shows uh, um, the Scottish Government actively seeking meetings with uh, witnesses on the name person legislation often the week before they were coming. Um, there's a whole series of emails to a whole range of organisations who were given evidence to this committee, um, seeking meetings in the week before explicitly to discuss their evidence to this committee, which I think is quite different from um, the Scottish Government in their routine, routinely looking to meet with stakeholders. And I wonder whether it would be worthwhile writing to John Swinney, asking for him to um, respond to the, the suggestion that would, would come from what the FOI looks like, which is that they've actively tried to engage with um, those giving evidence ahead of their evidence to this committee. And of course, the gap was between the written evidence they gave and then they come in with um, oral evidence. I know this is an issue that Oliver, Oliver Mundell has pursued before. I think it's very serious, but however, I'm prepared to perhaps ask this John Swinney for a, an initial response to what was being done in his name. Well. We are just going on to the work programme. If you think that's an item to be discussed, then we, we could do it in the work programme in, in the private session. <coughs> you, excuse me, you've got it out there. And if there's no other comments, then we're happy to move on. Right, thank you. That brings us to the pub end of the public part of the meeting. I will wait for the gallery to clear before moving on to the next item. Thank you for your attendance.